you know, as the Holy Spirit leads us, you know, we're learning, you know, we're learning. We don't have, you know, all the revelation that we're ever going to have right now. And as a matter of fact, you know, Billy Graham, Kenneth Hagin, if you listen to those guys, they don't feel like they hardly have any revelation compared to where what you can get. So the further along you get in God, the more you realize you don't know a whole lot. Um, <laughs> really, you don't. Because you can read all you want, but it's not that kind of knowledge. It's revelation knowledge. It's, it's walking in it and, and experiencing the word of God for yourself. Experiencing, not the word of God, but, but think about it like this. It's, it's really just experiencing the riches of the grace of God. The riches of the grace of, of his, of his, um, of his uh, what is it, the treasures and the things that were laid up for us. Um, you know, so we need to keep that, you know, in us so that we know how much time do we spend with the Lord? Well, for goodness sake, the longer we are, the, you know, it's like, how long do you soak the sponge? I mean, how, well, how saturated do you want it to be? You know, <laughs> some people you squeeze them and there's like, when trying to find something from the Lord and it's as dry as a bone. <laughs> there ain't been water in this sponge in a long time, <laughs> you know, so God wants us to be saturated in him, in his presence. And um, religion is like putting sand in your sponge. It's just not going to do much. And people hit it and poof, and the sand all over, and it gets on you. No good. But we want the presence of God. And you say, well, you know, how do I get, how do I get more of that? Well, the same way you get more water. You just keep your, keep your cup under it longer. You know, you keep your cup under for two seconds. You know, this morning I'm filling up my coffee thing, and, you know, from the, from the refrigerator, and I filled it up for just a few seconds, and it's only this much. Well, that's enough coffee for me, but not for Kim. <laughs> so I got to leave it under there so that Kim can have some coffee. Well, it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. You know, you say, well, I've received enough of the Holy Spirit. I'm good. Well, do you have enough for Kim? <laughs> do you have enough for, do you know what I'm saying? You know, you stay under the spout longer. That, that, that is for not for you. It's for everybody. So, you know, like I always tell you guys, and, you know, and I hope you guys do the same thing as me. You know, I say, I'm just going to go out there, set, be set on fire, and hope everybody sees me. Here I am. This is what it looks like to be on fire. Let's all be on fire. And, and I hope that that's the way all of us are, too. Just like, I'm going to be on fire, too. I want everyone around me to see that I'm on fire. Not that they say, you know, um, that guy's really religious, you know. Because sometimes people think, that, like, that guy's really religious. And then some people are like, well, that guy's just totally like in love with Jesus and I'd be like pretty much yeah that's pretty much it because you know you want to get religious sometimes sometimes you feel religious you know why people get religious because in the spirit right you're out there you're not sure you're like oh my goodness that's why we have the Holy Spirit he's our spirit guide I sound new age when I say that he's our spirit guide so he's our spirit guide so we get out there and we're in the spirit and we're just loving Jesus and be like is that all it takes is to love Jesus and Jesus is and we're out there in the spirit and we're like well but maybe we should have some rules. I'm going to make some rules about being in the spirit, okay? And so we get out there, and we're like, now, Holy Spirit, you're with me always. We're good, right? But we're going to make some rules. And so we make some rules. And so we, well, you can't go this far, and you can't go here, and you got to do this. And you got, there are rules, though. They're not in the Bible. There are rules. There are rules that we made up because we don't want things to get out of hand. Well, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit is always out of hand. If you're with him, you're out of hand. And I mean by out of hand, according to the world. Because he doesn't do things like we do in the world. So we make all these rules, and we say, okay, I need this and this. And so then we feel safe. It's a fake safe. You're not really safe in religion. As a matter of fact, you're more open to deception when you're in religion. Because you can get somebody up speaking, or you can deceive yourself into thinking, well, I'm very well versed in the word of God, and I can correct people. See, now you got a problem right there, right? That's how religious people get, because what's all this knowledge, what's all this religious knowledge do for you? It puffs you up so you can tell people what to do. Now you're controlling people. See, people feel comfortable when they're in control. Okay? This is a control thing, mind you. Yeah. Right? What does it say in the Bible about the Spirit of God? What's the Word of God say? That we're supposed to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes that makes us uncomfortable. That's the same thing as saying being out in the spirit, not knowing where you're going. Being under the control, being under the influence of the Holy Spirit makes us nervous because we're not sure what's going on. 
<laughs> right? It's true. You go up and you talk to somebody or God tells you to hand out a track or whatever, and you're talking to people and you're like, really? You don't know what he knows about anything. You just have to go by faith. It's totally faith. And so that's why religion comes in. That's the reason why in a lot, of, a lot of lives, the Holy Spirit isn't allowed to move like he wants to move because we've brought religious rules in to govern him. And he doesn't govern anything. He just flew away. You just aren't under his influence anymore. You know, not saying that he left you. I'm just talking about the spirit upon now. Okay, the spirit upon. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We're born of the spirit. He never leaves us or forsakes us. But there is an empowerment that comes upon us when the spirit comes upon. And when he comes upon, he moves us out into a realm that he's in. And it's not one we control. It's one he controls and we are controlled of him. Okay, so that's where God wants us to be at all the time. All the time. And to be under his influence all the time. So, you know, some people like to use the word, um, they have a lot of words for it. Slain in the spirit, filled with the spirit, baptized in the spirit. And then some people start to use the word drunk in the spirit, which I've used before here. Drunk in the spirit. Or um, some people use the word ecstasies. Okay, that's another one that people are like, ooh, that sounds new age. You know, but all of these type of things where we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit they all mean the same thing. It's all the same thing. And mysticism, they have a thing now, mystics, Christian mystics. Because, and it sounds weird because the devils use the word myst mystic is mystery. It's, a sp it's the spiritual realm. And God, we have a spirit guide, the Holy Spirit. And he guides us into all truth in the realm of the spirit, in the realm of the spirit, not in the natural realm. You can't put a book into this. This is the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you into these realms. Now, there is a book. It is, we have a, we have a map <laughs> and a compass, the Word of God, you know, so we don't go out into some realm in the Spirit. We're like, what in the world is that? And it says something that's against the Word. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak against the Word of God. But we are learning. That goes back to what I said at the very beginning. We are learning. And when you're learning and you get something wrong, you don't stop. Okay, you don't stop. You keep learning. If you make a mistake, you just keep going. What happens in the spirit realm is when there is a lot of religion in your life <laughs> or in the lives of people you've put yourself under, when you move out into the spirit and you make a mistake, they shut the whole thing down. And they say, do not get into the spirit realm like that anymore. Do not try to listen or move out in the spirit because we have rules. And that has violated those rules. So in our church, and, and it may make you nervous, we'll have people come in, and they may be moving out into the spirit like this, okay? And it's okay. They may make a mistake. They may hear something, and it could actually have been a wrong spirit. And we'll, but we'll know the word of God. Be like, oh, wait, that's wrong, because that's not in the word. Oh, so we're going to learn to flow in the spirit. Listen, don't tell me that that's no different than coming to church and having the pastor, me, <laughs> All upset and complaining and having a nasty attitude. Is he in the spirit? No. That's a wrong spirit too. But we give people a hard time when they hear something, they see it in the spirit realm. They say, well, that's weird. You're not weird. You're a spirit. Okay? You're going to see things. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I, can, I always say that. It's okay. Because people get nervous about being spiritual. I'm nervous about being spiritual. Do not be nervous about being spiritual. You know, God will show you things, and it's very simple, and it's very natural, and it happens all the time with us, but because of our rules, we shut it down. Because of our rules, we say, oh, well, that couldn't be the Lord. Well, ask him again. Write it down and think about it and look at it and see, is this right? You know, I, I'm, I'm becoming more and more aware of this. My spirit, by the Holy Spirit, is speaking to me a lot more than I'm realizing. A lot more. But because of my rules, because that's not the way I'm used to hearing it, Right? Because we get used to hearing things a certain way. Our church services are set up in a way because we're used to our church services being that way. It makes us comfortable. <laughs> we have three songs. We have, and I do our service because it's comfortable. We have three songs. We have prayer. We do this. We do that. And it's comfortable. But you know what? We all know this. We don't care about that. We just want to hear the word, and we want the spirit of God upon the word, and we want to grow. And that's what we're here for. But a lot of times in our flesh, which we do still deal with flesh, we like the comfortable stuff because the comfortable stuff makes us feel like we're in control. You're not in control. 
you've never been in control. And when you gave your life to Jesus, you really aren't in control. You completely lost all control. I'm talking about of making decisions in your life like that. We have self-control. That's a fruit of the Spirit. So balance it with that. Okay? Obviously, we have self-control. But when it comes to decisions that we make in our lives in hearing the voice of God and when we completely give ourselves over we can get to a point where we are filled with the spirit or baptized drunk in the spirit that just means overflowing the sponge is not supposed to be hey this is a wet sponge for me it's supposed to be a soak sponge that's dripping out so that when any comes buddy comes next to you what happened with Jesus with the with the woman with the issue of blood what did she do she touched the hem of his garment. How much anointing was coming off of him where she just touched the hem of his garment and out it comes. Soaked. Soaked. Completely drenched in the presence of God. So we should be really putting a priority on these things. You know, not just our Bible knowledge, but our presence in filling of the Holy Spirit. Putting a high priority on that. And you say, well, how do you do that? Well, just like we did this morning, we just worship. We just worship and just let the Lord fill us. You can do it by faith. You, he didn't go away. It wasn't like we have to, God has to, oh, God, you have to come down and, and, and do this again. Oh, no. When the Holy Spirit was poured out, it says that he covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. All you have to do is just put your hands up and receive. You do that by faith. You do that just like you receive Jesus. You just receive more of him, more of him, more of him. And guess what happens when you get more of him? You get less of you, <laughs> less of you, less of you. Because as he comes and fills you, all these thoughts and things that you have been glorifying and magnifying and worshiping, you know, because that's what we do. When you sit and meditate on something over and over again, it's a form of worship. And worry is like that. Why are you worshiping your problems? Why are you bowing down? Oh, problem, you are so great. You know, why are we doing that? Why don't we put our thoughts up on him? Because he has, it's all there. It's just all there. I don't know how else to say it. It's just all there. When you, when you just kind of, then pray in the spirit, pray in tongues. And then when you go up there, you're like, oh, look, everything's here. Room's, room's stocked. We're good. We have everything that we need. You come down and you're in earthly thinking and worldly thinking and it's lack. There's not enough of this. There's not enough of that. How is this going to, that's the curse. We're not under the curse. We're under the blessing of God. The blessing is upon us, and the blessing makes us rich. Yes. So if everyone's worried about being rich, well, you are rich. You're already rich. You're loaded. <laughs> You're loaded. <laughs> but see, we need to be filled with the Spirit so that we can walk in the Spirit. What happened when Jesus and his disciples needed money for taxes? What did he tell them to do? He said, go fishing. And they pulled the first fish out, and there was a coin in its mouth that was enough to pay for the taxes. They're all worried. Where are we going to get money for taxes? He's like, oh, go fishing. Have you ever had Jesus ask you to do something that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever? Go fishing. And one fish is the one that had the coin. Remember, they, they've been fishing before and had a whole net where it broke, right? So they're thinking, maybe they're thinking, it's all the fish. The fish, all the, the number of fish that are coming in, that's going to pay for the taxes. And he said, oh, no, just go fishing. And they got a fish, and it has one coin, and that's enough. You don't have to do things like we think. You know, we sit and figure it out and say, well, God, you could do this, you could do that. Don't worry about how he's going to do it. Just stay in the spirit. And when Jesus speaks, do it. Whatever he says, do it, even if it makes no sense at all. Do it. This is where people, this is, this, listen, this is the key. When Jesus speaks to your heart and tells you to do something and you do it, just do it. Your head can tell you what are you doing the whole time you're doing it. The whole time, and even after you did it, your head is going to say, that was really dumb. Why did you do that? Don't worry about your head. Your head and your spirit may not have been in tune with each other that day. But don't back down. Let's say that you do something like that, and it wasn't your spirit. It was your head, and you made a mistake. Do you stop? No, you keep going. You keep doing the right thing. You keep listening to the Holy Spirit. One of the things that God will show us, he's showing me this anyway, show you guys, I mean, I don't know, he shows everybody different things, but one of the things that he's showing me is that when he tells us that something is good, it has a lot of times to do with the precious fruit of the earth. Many times, the precious fruit of the earth, like um, stuff isn't a big deal to him, but it's not precious. Like, 
a Lamborghini is, is all right. It's not precious to him. He's like, I can make a million of them things. He doesn't really care about that. That's not, I mean, he cares about it if we cared about it. Like if we're like, I really want a Lamborghini to really show the Lord how much he blesses us. And it's just, I just like one. And he would probably like it for that reason. But when he brings us into certain things, he's bringing us to places where there's precious fruit. There's precious fruit there. And so sometimes you're in situations it's like, why, why did this thing work like that? And he's like, so that you could say that to that person three days into when this happened, I wanted you to say that and you said it. Amen. One thing, that was it. That was the only thing that he wanted out of that. But that particular seed that was sown is the seed that's going to bring them to Jesus. Very, I don't, how would I possibly know that? I couldn't know that. But Jesus knows. So that's what I'm saying. When he says, go fishing, you go fishing. When he says, don't worry, you don't worry. All of those things work together because he doesn't miss anything. He knows all of it, and it's all interconnected. Everything is very interconnected. This is one thing that I'm, I always think about is how everything is interconnected. It's all interconnected even though we don't realize it's interconnected, and sometimes it's interconnected in space and time because God thinks in more dimensions than we do. <laughs> so it's tough for us to comprehend that because he's multi-dimensional thinking continually and then he just tells us one thing <laughs> and so you're not going to figure that out just not you're not going to figure that out now but you will figure one thing out and that is what he tells you and that is that you can trust him and that is that he has a supply for you and that is that there are things and places and people and situations that he has in store for us that are going to bring us to greater depths of glory and greater relationship with him greater trust in him greater knowledge of how much he loves us those are the kind of things that God shows us that's important to him this is important to him you know with 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 our spouses with our people that we love isn't it important to to show your love like I want to be able to you know did you ever do the five love languages book we did that last week again. If you guys want those, we have those. But the five love languages is it shows what language you speak of love. Because what's the most important thing? Our flesh wants to know, well, or is anybody speaking my language? But in, in reality, when there's people that we love, we're like, well, I want to show them love. And, and God is us. He wants to continually demonstrate. He demonstrated his love in Jesus. That's the ultimate demonstration of love. But that wasn't the end of his demonstration of love. That was the beginning. Because remember what it says, if he would, wouldn't even spare his own son, how much more would he give you these things, the riches of the kingdom of heaven? And sometimes our thinking is down on this earthly level of, well, God's going to give me th this earthly level. Well, sure he could, but there are better things in the spiritual realm. There are higher things in the spiritual realm that are true riches. Remember what he says, he who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. Have you thought about that? What is little and what is much? The little is the earthly thing. So if he gives you $10 million, you're being faithful in a little so that you would be faithful with much. You see, if you are, you know, a highly successful entrepreneur, now you're being faithful in a little and he will make you faithful with much. We're, we really have it backwards. We think that little and much is little and much, and it's all down here. It's not little and much down here. Everything here is little. The much is there. It's all little here. It's all. We keep our minds so it's like, look up, and we're like, we were like this, and now we're like this. No, I meant look up, and we're like, <laughs> and now we're looking up there. No, look up. He wants us to look up. You see, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ. Stop looking up like this. That's not where the stuff is. The stuff is up. <laughs> Love, peace, joy, patience, goodness, gentleness, meekness, all of these things, the gifts of the Spirit, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, seeing things in the Spirit, seeing angels, seeing the presence of God, spending time in fellowship with Him, seeing heaven, seeing these things open before us just like they show us in the New Testament. Those are the riches. Those are the things that are amazing. We will be there, guys. We will be there. We're going to be there. We're going to see it. What he's trying to tell us is now the kingdom of heaven is here on the earth. 
You don't have to wait to get to heaven. The kingdom of heaven is here now. So these are the riches. These are the good things that when we're faithful with a little, we'll be faithful with much. The much is the spiritual. The little is the material. So we are supposed to be faithful with the material. We are supposed to be faithful with the ungodly mammon, as he said. But the true riches are the spiritual riches. The true riches are the things that are above. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, because the earth and the things of the earth are passing away. So stay filled. Don't be nervous about um, and set up religious boundaries because this is the way we've always done it. That's a particular, you know, they do a business side of this too, you know, in business. They say, like, that's the end of your business when you start saying things like that. Let me tell you, it is. Like, when your business is like, this is the way we do it because it's the way we always did it, even though it's completely broken, that's like a bad business thing. Well, the reason it's a bad business thing is because it's also a bad spiritual thing. That's the only reason it's a bad business thing. Because you want to be adaptable in business. You want things to be uh, fluid so you can move and make changes so that you can have superiority in your market, right? Because it's business. And that's fine. And business is good. But in the spiritual realm, you don't want to do that either because God's not in business with you. It's not a business relationship that we have with God. He's our Father. He loves us. And he wants fellowship with us. He, he, he just wants to hang out with us. It's very like normal and natural. We may be businessy. And you know what? If we're businessy in our relationships, he'll biz, be businessy with us. He will because that's the way we approach him. So he'll be like, all right, we'll do this as business. And he'll do it like business because he loves us so much. But I'm just letting you know it's all the different levels are all there. You can just come in and just be like, God, and he'll be like, hey, man, it's all right. You know, because that's the way he is. Because he comes to us, when we come to him in love, he, he gives us back love. So trust in the Lord. Amen? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So that's a scripture right there that can kind of sum up the beginning here of what we're saying. So we're in John uh, 14, and we're talking about the helper, the Holy Spirit. And uh, last week... I'm pretty sure <laughs> that I talked about how Jesus said that he would not leave us orphans, but that he would come to us. And I, I'm, I believe that I talked about how um, that a little while longer in the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. And he said in verse 20, at that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And then I, I said, well, what day is that day? And that day is the day that you see Jesus. So on that day that you saw Jesus, now you see that Jesus is in the Father, and that we are in him, and he is in us. We're one. We're one with Jesus now. We are one with Jesus. And you say, but my head doesn't feel like he's one with Jesus, but he's not one with your head. He's one with your spirit. Our head needs to be renewed. If it wasn't for our head, all this would just, you just see it all. I mean, you just see it. I mean, it would just all be there. We didn't even have to tell you about it because you just see it. But you need your mind renewed. We all need our minds renewed because the natural world, this, this flesh, this, this mind, is, is programmed to be in the carnal realm, in the uh, sin um, and cursed realm. So it's been trained to be like that because it's here. And it just teaches you immediately. Immediately it teaches you. From the time you were born, it starts to teach you right away. Even though as young children are alive to God, you know, they can, sometimes they see angels and different things. You don't know what they see, but they're alive to God. But still, the, the world immediately has an impact, immediately, on us. So we have to have our mind renewed to the word of God. So there's this light that comes from, from Jesus. And it's, and it's a bright light. It's enough to light the whole world up. It's not like just a little light. Because light, remember in John 1, it talks about he's the light of the world. The only light of the world. <laughs> not, there's many lights in the world and I'm one. He didn't say that. People teach that now, by the way. They teach it. There are many lights. Buddha's a light. Hindu gods are a light. This is a, they're not lights. They're all in darkness. All of them in darkness. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the only light. But he's bright enough to light the whole world up. And when he lights us up, we become part of the light. And so now that part of the world is lit up with Jesus too. 
right? Because we're just these lights. Do, 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 do. do you ever see a globe with the lights at night and you can see everything lit up and then like they show North Korea and it's like completely dark? That's sad. We should pray for North Korea. Those guys need to be set free. That's a bad, that guy's a bad dude. So, so he's the light of the world. So the day we see Jesus, so we see Jesus when the Father reveals him to us, right? So we hear the word of God, which is light. <laughs> we believe the word of God. We see the light. And then what happens? Jesus comes to live in us. See what I'm saying? So when, on what day do we see Jesus? On the day, on what day do we become one? On the day that we see him. This is speaking in spiritual, this is revelation, spiritual terms. So let's look at this. I'm in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Okay? I'm in my Father. This is on uh, verse 20. Yeah, John 14, 20. At that day you will know that I'm in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father are all three are one. <laughs> That's why he said, I in you. When we partake of the word of God, okay, it becomes a part of us. It, it actually becomes a part of our being. When I eat food, food becomes a part of me. So we call our food the things that it's made out of. Right? So if I eat a banana, what is it that becomes a part of you? Potassium. <laughs> right? That's one thing. Carbohydrates. Um, maybe not many carbohydrates. Um, calories. Right? But what are we really saying? We're saying banana. <laughs> I just ate a banana, and now banana is in me. Banana is running through my blood. I've got banana. Me and banana are one. We're one. I'm one with banana now. <laughs> right? Is that not right? Is that not how food works? It's not external from us. It's, it's a part of us now. Now, I'm not literally turning into a banana because that would be weird, right? Because then all of a sudden it would be like, all of a sudden my, but have you ever eaten a lot of carrots and your skin starts turning orange? It does. I've had it happen. It's the beta carotene or whatever. And if you eat too many of them, you're, you'll start to turn orange. I've had it happen. So if you wanted evidence, I'm not turning into a carrot, but that's good evidence that I ate a lot of carrots because I started to turn orange. So in the natural realm, that's how food works. We just got real scientific with it and, and used all the components of the food. And because we're in the earth, not everything we use, there's waste, right? But now we're talking about the spiritual realm, okay? So when we partake, when we partake, of the word of God, it becomes a part of us. We eat it. We all eat. So we all, have you ever eaten dinner with somebody? You're all eating together. You're partaking of the food. You all have something in common now. If you all had bananas, you all have bananas, right? You've all partaken of the banana <laughs> or pizza or steak. <laughs> I like steak. So, God's word is Jesus. Jesus is the word made flesh. And we, when we eat the word, it becomes a part of us. Have you ever experienced food poisoning? Everyone who's experienced food poisoning goes, oh, yes. Anyone who hasn't was like, nope. If you've experienced food poisoning, not fun, not good. You sometimes think you might die depending on how bad it is, but you won't die. But it does feel like you could. <laughs> food poisoning is bad stuff, depending on what level. Or if you have bad food. So what happens when you're having food poisoning? Your body is rejecting the food. It's saying, this food is bad. There is not only not nutrients in it, but there's poison in it, and I'm rejecting it. Did you know that you can eat spiritually food that your body, your spirit does not need to be eating? It is poisonous. And the Holy Spirit will reject <laughs> that food <laughs> and say, no, I do not want that. But depending on how healthy you are, <laughs> depends on what level you're going to reject that. If you've been on a steady diet of bad food, it's going to start to come out in other ways. <laughs> right? If you're on a steady diet of bad food, it comes out, you know, in other ways. You're not eating the food that you need. 
you're eating bad food, it's not healthy for you. You may be more susceptible to germs, more susceptible to sickness, right? If you're eating not healthy food all the time, okay? Like maybe you just eat, you drink Mountain Dew and eat potato chips. Probably not very healthy for you, right? It's going to, it's going to come out somewhere in your body at some point. Whether now or later, it will. And sometimes it takes a while. Spiritually, it's the same way, okay? If we've been eating a steady diet of the wrong foods that don't have any, any nourishment in them, okay, Does, is Mountain Dew labeled as poison? No. It's just really sugary, right? And it's got a lot of bubbles and sugar and caffeine and stuff in it. And people like it and they drink it in moderation, you know, or whatever. Or some people don't. They just drink a giant thing of Mountain Dew every morning. But those kind of foods over time can have an impact on our health physically. And having a steady diet, okay, of non-food or food with very little to no nutritional value will have an effect on us spiritually. And it doesn't always come out right away. Sometimes it takes a while. So if I have spent I can just tell you from experience, because this is not a condemnational thing. This is a healthy eating day, right? So if I spend every night just watching movies, right, just playing video games, I don't spend any time with the Lord, not because you have to spend time with the Lord, and that's what I told you, and that's the rule. No, because I want to eat the Word, because I need to eat the Word, and I need to eat things that are healthy. Over time, that's going to have an impact on my spiritual life. I'm going to reach for muscle, and I'm going to be weak. So partaking of the Word of God is a wonderful thing. So we can see that there are these different things that we can allow in. What you focus on, your heart is drawn to. So if we start to, if I sit and think about... Um, you know, video games or whatever, I, my heart will start to be drawn to like thinking about well, what's the next game or whatever, or the next new Star Wars movie or, you know, I'm just telling you, this is the kind of things that I think about. Most people are like, that is not interesting to me at all. But maybe it's interior decorating or maybe it's, you know, gardening or is there anything wrong with gardening? Is there anything wrong with interior decorating? No, there's not. It just doesn't have a nutritional value to it that is going to affect your spirit in any way. Now, you can take the gardening, you can take the interior decorating, and you can bring the Word with you, and you can bring the Holy Spirit with you, and you can enjoy it together. Because that you can do. And I can enjoy Star Wars together. Okay, so... <laughs> okay, hey, come on. So... I think about, I'll just give you a list of things. Magazines, websites, video games, TV, movies. They're focus items. They're focusing. Home maintenance, <laughs> bills. I'm not saying this stuff is bad. I mean, if you don't focus on your bills, you're going to be in trouble. If you don't focus on your home maintenance, you're going to be in trouble. But what you focus on is what you, your heart goes after. I'm talking about focusing on. I'm talking about focusing, I'm not talking about just doing it. I'm talking about focusing on it, putting your focus and your attention and everything that you have into these things. That's what you start to get drawn to. Boating, fishing, the beach, they're focus items. They can be focus items. And we can go, and, here, and here's the thing. So we focus on things on the earth. Let's say we do that. Church. For ministers, they can focus on church. That's bad, too. <laughs> if a minister starts focusing on church, you're going to have a problem. He needs to be focusing on the Lord, Keep putting our focus on him. You know, God will take care of these other things. But here's, what, here's the thing that the Lord is saying. We can go as far as we want. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We can go as far as we want. There's no limit. There's no limit for him. He doesn't have a limit for us. It's not like, oh, you hit the limit, Jamin. You're going to have to back it down and do something different now. There's no limit when it comes to him. When we focus on him, it's an unlimited supply. Have you ever read stories of missionaries that travel around the world, and you think to yourself, how did that happen? <laughs> they focused. 
And when they focus, and I'm not saying missionary, I'm saying anything. It could be anything. But great things in God come through focus. Great things in God come through focusing on him because the thing is in him. The, 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 the riches and the, and the place that you can go to is in him, and there's no limit to it. There's no limit to focusing on him. When we focus on the things of the world, we're limiting ourselves. We're limiting what God can do through us. It's not that there's anything wrong with him. It's just a limitation. We're putting our, a limit on it. And like I said, hey, I can take God with me in my Lamborghini. It's fine. I mean, we'll love it. It'll be fun together. And I don't have a problem with that. And, and one day I'll have one of them, not a Lamborghini, but if a similar car I'll have, and we'll have a great time together. It'll be wonderful. But I'm not focusing on it because it, it's just a thing. Who cares, right? But I focus on him because he's the most important thing. And so as I focus, as I begin to focus, now I'm realizing that there's these realms. There's these realms of God. There's these places in God that I can go to that are wonderful. And the more I focus on him, the more he unveils it to me. So when we partake of the word of God, so remember, we're focusing on him, and now we're talking about he, he is in us and we are in him, and he is in the Father, right? So we're in him, he's in us, we're in the Father. Focusing on that, focusing on who we are, and then we begin to partake of the word of God. What is it? To partake, partake of the word of God is to believe it. It's to believe it and to do it. That's how you partake. Believe it and do it. Listen, Pharisees don't need to believe anything. <laughs> right? They don't. Because they have their works. They can just show you. Work, 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 work. There's no faith associated with religion. There's no faith associated with that. So let's go back again. So we partake of it. So we are eating it and it becomes a part of our spirit. We're partaking of the word of God. We're hearing the word, we're believing the word, we're doing the word, now it becomes a part of us. It becomes a part of our being. It's the potassium and the carbohydrates and the, all of the substance, the spiritual substance in the word of God. You can't talk about this about anything other than the word of God. Nothing, I mean, the other stuff, like I said, it has no substance to it. I can read Gone with the Wind, what a wonderful book. I can read that book and just be like, man, that was a great story. No spiritual substance. Unless there's some Bible verses in it, I have no idea. <laughs> but there's no spiritual substance in that book. But there's natural substance. So don't cap it there. Bring it in. Bring it to the next because there's no limit. And God is so gracious. Like if we say, well, Lord, we like, you know, we like the Sunday morning God experience. You know, because that's why, this is why, and I understand the heart, you know, just trust me on this. I understand the heart, and I don't know if everybody always does this still, but they talk about a Sunday morning experience. We want people to have a Sunday morning experience, a church experience. Jesus didn't die for us to have a church experience. <laughs> that's a mistake. <laughs> so, but I think a lot of folks, when, when you talk to them, ministers and stuff, you realize that actually is deep down in their heart. But, you know, ministry can be tough. Yeah. You know, it can be tough. You can get beat up pretty hard. I mean, you can put 10, 20 years into somebody and see a pastor and off they go. And you're like, man, they just left. That's hard on pastors. I understand that. I had to leave a church three times. And I, every time I'm thinking, I can't, I can't help them any more than I am. I'm like, I'm sorry. I just, I had to, you know, it was the Lord, you know. But it can be tough, and sometimes you're just like, well, you know what, we're just going to make this about an experience. And in your heart, you get hard, you know, because you've got to toughen up. You know, you can't let them get to you, you know, because hurt, it hurts your feelings, you know. But you can't be like that. Love people still. Let, let, and, and you know what the other thing? I'm getting into my own message for myself. But anyway, it's not about, it's not about you. Ministry is not about you. This is not about me. The thing that's about me is me and God. You know, it's not about me. It's about him. And it's about him bringing to you what it is that he wants. And to me, too. He's bringing it to all of us. So partake of the word. Jesus is in us. Life is in us. Partaking isn't just listening. We don't partake of the word just by listening. Partaking isn't even saying. Because sometimes everyone wants us to say it. Okay, repeat after me and we all say it. That's still not partaking. <laughs> 
It's a good thing to practice, though, because you learn about confessing, because you should speak the word of God out. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying confessing out loud is bad either. So just, just remember, anytime I make these, suge- these things, I'm say it in balance, okay? I'm just looking at one aspect of it. Yes, I do believe that we should speak and confess out loud, absolutely. And as a congregation, we should. I think that's good. And I do think that when you have a Sunday morning service, it shouldn't be falling over on the floor looking like you just thought about it two seconds ago. Okay? So, yeah. So, they should have at least something nice and people come together. You know, that's the reason we're meeting in a hotel and not, you know, out in the parking lot. Okay? Because, so there's a balance to everything. Okay? So, just keep that in mind. Um, Turn to James chapter 1. Anne's anger does not promote the righteousness God wishes and requires. Why? Why why did he say that? Why did he say not to get angry? Because it doesn't promote righteousness. We're not in a receiving mode. We're not in a receiving. We're looking at the meal, but we don't have a fork in our hand. We're just looking at it, and we're angry. It's not promoting the righteousness God wishes are, are required. Now, in verse 21, it says, So get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness, and in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word, which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your souls. This is the same thing that Jesus is talking about when he said, I am in you, you are in me, I am in my Father. That's the word. It becomes a part of us. It's why it says to allow it in, to welcome the word, to welcome the word of God. Don't push it away. How do we receive the word of God? It says here, in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive A humble, gentle, modest spirit. Have you ever heard a word from God and immediately your flesh rose up? You heard a word, God said, you know, really, you should, you know, respect your wife or something. Maybe you're like, oh, what? What's your first first emotion that you feel? Anger. (laughs) What did it just say here? For man's anger does not promote the righteousness God wishes and requires. It's anger. Your flesh is angry with hearing that word. No, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Have you ever told people about Jesus? Get away from me. I don't want to hear about Jesus. It, even on the Periscope, which it isn't on now, but on Periscope, if you preach on Periscope, people will get angry with you. No, I don't want to hear you, pre- you preachers. You know, and then a lot of times people now, they get so nervous, they say, well, I don't want to preach. I don't want to be preachy. Yeah, well, you don't want to be preachy. That's fine. But if you're speaking the word of God, you should be speaking the word of God. The word of God spoken to you. The word of God spoken to us. We receive the word. This is how we receive it. Why wouldn't we want to release it? We need to release the word, too. So the flesh never, ever, ever wants to do the word. (laughs) It will never, ever want to do it. It will never, ever want to do the things of God, ever. That is the last thing of all the list of things the flesh wants to do. At the very last is do the word of God and receive from God. It, has, it goes in the opposite direction yeah. of the spirit, right? Because when I say the flesh continually pushes, pushes against the spirit, pushes against the spirit. No, just sit around and eat cupcakes and watch soap operas on TV. That's what you should be doing today. That's what the flesh wants. It doesn't want that. And then you say the word of God. No. Cranky. Right? So what's the answer? Humble yourself. Humble yourself. And we can humble ourselves. Once we humble ourselves, we're in a position. All you have to remember when you humble yourself to God is that he loves you so much. He is really wanting to get to you awesome stuff. He wants to, it's not a disciplinary type of thing. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not like I have to go work out. Do you understand? This is a problem. This is a problem in modern churches. Their relationship with God is more of a self-help guru. He is their self-help guru. And if you submit to God and humble yourself, he'll give you the regimen. 
the workout regimen, the this regimen, the that regimen, the this and that and the other, you know, and the check boxes so that you can be the best you you can be. And that is not what he's saying. He is all about, 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 about spending time going fishing with you, spending time playing video games with you, spending time going shopping with you, spending time with you when you're driving in your car and receiving with meekness, receiving with humility the word that's engrafted into your soul, and it saves your soul. You see? You say, I didn't know my soul needed saving. Have you ever had a conversation in your head before? Between doing the word of God and not, oh yeah, your soul needs saving. And that's how you save it, through receiving. Remember I said before, partaking. You eat bananas, you get bananas. Now you're a banana. Part banana. You are part banana. You are now, when you receive the word of God, part Jesus. Jesus becomes part of you. You are in him. He is in you. The more of the word of God you receive, the more Jesus you become. Right? The more Jesus you are. But you can't receive in anger. You can't receive when you approach God as the self-help guru who's going to help you be the best you you can be and give you the daily workout regimen to be the best you. He says, sit, eat, rest. Jesus said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Religious spirits impersonate Jesus. Know this. There are many of them, and some of them have high levels of position within religious organizations. Where do you think the false doctrine comes from? It's not coming from late night talk show hosts. It's coming from preachers. <laughs> so be aware whenever your relationship with God becomes this rules upon rule upon my daily regimen of how I can be the best me I can be. And now you're working and working and working for God. You know what I'm saying? How do you spell ministry? W-R-K. But how do you spell relationship? L-O-V-E. It starts with relationship, not with work. God isn't training you to become the best administrator in the world. He's not about administrating you so that you can administrate everything. It's not an administrative. This is not an administrative organization. It's a spirit-filled, life-giving, love of God organization, and it's, full, it's a family. It's a family. And I appreciate the fact that organizations have gone to great depths to create these spectacular, wonderful, tiered systems. But they're religious systems. They are religious. I can make a religious system. It's a lot of work, but you can do it. But God has a better way than that. Right? He has a better way. It's relational. It's relationship. Have you ever wondered why the Pharisees never got it? You know, they never got it. Jesus is there, the Son of God in the flesh. They're the ones that know the Bible. <laughs> right? They're the ones that should know. And they didn't get it. And then they killed him. <laughs> not even did they not get it. They did the, the wrong thing. They had him crucified. Right? And it wasn't the, it wasn't the Pharisees, mind you, that, that crucified him. He gave himself for the world. It was the world that crucified him. But those are the ones that the world, the religious spirits used were the Pharisees. Religious spirits are the worst. They're the meanest. They are the meanest. You think an atheist spirit is mean. They ain't nothing compared to religious spirits. They are mean. So religious people have a common sin. Pride. And that's why they never change. Pride keeps people from responding to God. Pride keeps you from responding to God. When you have pride in your heart and God speaks to you, that pride resists him. And God resists you when you're proud. So the Bible says, humble yourself. God's not going to humble you. Oh, that happened to me so that God would humble me. Nope, God doesn't humble you. The Bible says humble yourself. <laughs> There's nowhere in Scripture where it says God did this to humble him. That's not how it works. God doesn't force you to do anything. He doesn't even force you to become humble. That's something that you have to do. You have to humble yourself. And pride resists God. It resists God because the flesh resists God. So if you want to know more about this particular topic, read my book. No, read, <laughs> read the parable of the sower. Okay, because the parable, I mean, it doesn't get, and I decided I was not going to teach on the parable of the sower today too, but the parable of the sower, because there's just so much in there, I'd be there for four weeks. Something that I'm not getting in today, just read it. 
and it's about the different grounds and how the word comes in. But see, what I'm emphasizing today is receiving the word, partaking, eating the word. And you receive it through humility. You receive it not through anger and putting away anger and putting away this resistance because all this anger and all this is pride. It's our own pride. But see, what we need to do is open our eyes and see Jesus for who he is, not as this rule-making, instigated super administrator who's looking to administer his entire church into some giant megacorp. Okay, that's not, that is a completely foreign concept to heaven. That is not a heavenly concept whatsoever. Heaven is not a mega corporation. It is not, with the, with the head CEO being God the Father. That is not how it works. It's not. Look in the Bible. Tell me if it looks anything like a mega corp. It does not look like a mega corp. So taking our fleshy corporate concepts and ideas and trying to apply it to the family of God is out of order. And it's wrong. And God has had enough of it, honestly. He has. He's, he's done. He's already taken his candle away from a lot of these places anyway that had it. People just need to quit this. Come back to the Lord. Repent. I have to repent, guys. I'm repenting. I've repented many times because I treated God that way. And he does. He, it's just not nice. We go on and on. Don't call the Holy Spirit an it. He's a he. But then we treat God like he's a mega corporate multimillionaire CEO billionaire. He's not. He's your heavenly father. You don't say that about a CEO, that you're one with the CEO, and the CEO is in you, and you are in the CEO. That would be very weird, wouldn't it? Yes, of course you don't talk like that, because guess what? God's not a CEO. He's your heavenly father, and his word it needs to become a part of us. And that word will transform us. And so when you eat the nutrients that are in the word, all of a sudden now you have strength. Now, all of a sudden, you have the Spirit upon you, and the Helper is, is working with you. Now, look at John. It's 1130. I'm going to finish now with this. Look at John again. So we looked at James. Now, look at John 1421. I will end with this verse here. I actually have more, but we had a fire alarm. <laughs> Not that type of fire. Listen, we already had the fire alarm go off in here a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> the fire of God. <laughs> All right, John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Do you see the similarities here? He who has my commandment and keeps them, it is he who loves me. That's what it says in James here. Okay? If you look at James, we'll go, we'll go back to it. But this is what he's saying. When we keep his commandments, we love him. When we love Jesus... We are loved by the Father. Our love for Jesus causes him to manifest himself. Our love for Jesus causes him to manifest himself. When he hears our love for him, when our love for him is stirred, and we just send that love out to him, he manifests himself in us and through us. Not just in a church service. I mean just right smack dab at your house. Jesus will manifest love to you right there. Because that's what it causes. That's the trigger. How do I get Jesus to manifest in my life? Love him. Just, and all you have to do is respond to his love. It's, he already gave it to you. It's not like you have to drum up some love for God. It's like, all right, why do I love God again? Okay, let, no, just listen, listen. And he says, to what he's saying to you, what he's saying to you. Just look at Jesus, what he's saying to you. You know, I told you guys this was a Thursday or was it last week. Sometimes when you see Jesus, when you see Jesus, and he's smiling, Jesus smiles. Did you know that Jesus is a very, he's very happy. And he's not old. He's a young guy. He's younger than me. And he's happy. He's always happy. He's, he's always smiling. Whenever I, I've seen him, he smiles a lot. And he's, ha he's happy. And let me tell you something. When you see Jesus, he just emanates love. He emanates, it's everywhere on him. You're just looking at him and you're like, I'm loved. He loves me. And then I think to myself, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be just fine. Jesus is here now. You know, I think about things like today is Mother's Day. My mother went home to be with the Lord three years ago. But I just think about that. And that's a terrible thing to have to happen early like that. And you think to yourself, oh my goodness, what grief. It's like, no, that's not grief for me. I, re I, I rebuke grief. There's a spirit of grief. You need to be very careful. You need to be very careful. 
What we need to do is see heaven. And like one time when you see Jesus and you think to yourself, we really aren't here very long anyway. And what a glorious time we're going to have. Because he's just looking at me and saying that he loves us so much. It's like almost like it's overwhelming when you think about it. That love, that love that he has for us that has never waned. You give that love back to him. When you give that love back to him, he manifests himself in beautiful ways, beautiful ways, just ways that are beyond your understanding where you look at it afterwards and you're like, how could that even have happened? I could have never planned for something like that because he's the master of space and time and all of it and he can put it all together in a way and when you look at it as much as Satan, he boasts, he thinks he's got something. He ain't got nothing on Jesus. Seriously, how much death and destruction, think about men that go to war. Think of how much they see how much wickedness they see and how much evil of people just being slaughtered all day. Men and fathers and all of this, just all the destruction that Satan puts in front of their eyes. But Jesus can come down in the middle of a place, even like a war zone, and he can manifest love in the hearts of soldiers and in the hearts of people that have seen wicked, evil things because the love of God is greater. It's greater than the world. It is greater than sin. It is greater than the devil. It is greater than the princes of the power of the air. They boast, they cry, they do all they want to do to make you be afraid of them and say, oh, how can just a feeling of love from God be greater? Oh, it's greater. It's love that raised Jesus from the dead. It's love that heals the sick. It's love that brings peace into people's lives who have never had it. That's the love of God. So you just answer the devil when he tells you that because he's a liar. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. Jesus defeated him. He doesn't want you to know that. (laughs) It's a big secret for him. (laughs) Don't say that part. You can say anything you want, but don't say that he was defeated because he's big and strong still. Oh, no, he's not big and strong. He's been disarmed in the new covenant. So he wreaks havoc on his own people. But we come in with light, and that whole thing changes. So respond to God with love, his love for us. Don't respond to him out of works. He doesn't need your works. Works isn't what he's responding to. You say, can I sit down and not do anything and just love Jesus? Yes, you can. You can. You can just sit there and think about Jesus and love him. And think about how good he is and love him. And you can do that. And he'll love you back. And there's no requirement there. And there's no seven steps to six ways to 15 things to make you the best you you can be before God will say, Hey, he did it. Bing. Level up. He doesn't do that. He just loves us. So listen. Listen to his voice. You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body, but you are a spirit. You are a spiritual being. You are created in the image of Jesus now. It's not going to happen. It already happened. It already happened. (laughs) This is like the big news right now. It already happened. You don't have to wait for it to happen. So receive it. How do you receive it? By faith. Your spirit knows how to believe God. Your spirit knows how to receive. It already knows how to do these things. What about my head? That's the part that needs to be renewed. You respond from here, not from here. Say, but what if my head gives me a hard time? It's always going to give you a hard time. It has to be renewed. I mean, it might get quieter. It gets quieter the more the words you get. It's like, like, before it was like, you shouldn't do that. Are you out of your mind? You shouldn't be praying. Why are you praying? And then after a while, it's like, You know, it's like really quiet, but it's still there because it's the flesh. But we renew it, and and the word is able to save our souls. So Jesus is in us, and we are in him, and he is in the Father, and his love has been shed abroad in our hearts. And as we receive the love, as we respond to the love, manifestation of Jesus in our lives, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter if there's a fire alarm and there's announcements or whatever, Jesus manifests love all the time. Amen? Amen. That was part of my message. So, but that was our message from the Lord today. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your word. Thank you for uh, making it alive to our hearts and showing us the great riches of the inheritance in the saints. Lord, we commit ourselves to you today. We thank you that we walk by faith and not by sight. And Father, I just pray a blessing on all the mothers today. Father, I thank you that You bring mothers into our lives, and that is 
a wonderful thing. So, Lord, thank you for the blessing that we celebrate today of Mother's Day. And, um, Lord, we just love our mothers, and we just thank you for them today. And, Father, we ask that a blessing would be on each of us as we go today. Let, our, let your word just go down into our hearts, into the deep parts of our hearts, that it would produce, produce the fruit it needs to. Show us your ways, Lord. Help us to shake off the shackles and the, and the, um, the dust of, of religious works and come into your presence now by faith in the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.